Welcome to the Tipping Point Show. I'm Jimmy Evans. We have a great show for you today. You know, I've been talking about Matthew chapter 25, and I've been talking about the judgments. Jesus in Matthew chapter 24 was asked by the disciples, what would be the signs of the end times? And Matthew 24 is just a tremendous answer that Jesus gave to let us know that, you know, we're in the end times and we're experiencing many of the signs that have taken place. But then in Matthew chapter 25, he goes directly from Matthew 24 and in Matthew 25. And in Matthew chapter 25, he tells two parables and a true story about how we will be judged when he returns. This is very important for everybody to know about. Parable of the virgins was the first parable. The virgins, there were five foolish virgins who did not get into the marriage supper of the Lamb. This is when the rapture happens. There were five wise virgins who knew the bridegroom. They spent their time developing a relationship with the bridegroom. He came back. The ones that knew him came in. The ones that didn't know him were rejected. That's when the rapture happens. The true church goes. The false church is left behind. And according to Jesus, half of the church is false. I'm going to talk about that more now in this teaching. And it's very important to know who those people are. So then he talks about the parable of the talents. We've been talking about that for a couple of weeks. We're saved by grace, but we're judged according to our works. Okay, Matthew 16, Revelation 22, both of those are texts where Jesus tells us that we're going to be judged by our works. Now, we're saved by grace. We relate to Jesus by grace. His throne is the throne of grace. So everything is about grace, but our lives are going to be reviewed when Jesus returns. When the, the Bema seat of Christ, the judgment seat of Christ for believers is not a judgment of punishments. It's a judgment of rewards, and some people will be lavishly rewarded. And by the way, everything is rewarded. Jesus said, if you give a, one of these little ones a cup of cold water in my name, you'll not lose your reward. And so everything is rewarded, and that's the good news. God notices everything. And so we are going to be judged. I talked in the last program, last Tipping Point show, about the fact, the parable of the talents and the minas, that we are given authority to rule uh, during the millennial reign of Christ based on how we lived our lives here on this earth. So it's, it's a big deal. I want to talk about in this show, I want to talk about the judgment of the sheep and goats. There are three, two parables and a true story in Matthew 25, all relating to when Jesus comes back, how we're going to be judged. Okay, now there's a difference between the parables and the true story. And here's the difference. The parables occur at the beginning of the tribulation when the rapture occurs, okay? The parable of virgins, Jesus comes, we are taken to the uh, marriage supper of the lamb at the beginning. The judgment seat of Christ happens at the beginning. Jesus said, I'm coming quickly and my reward is with me. Okay, so when Jesus comes, we're all judged as believers. But then at the end of the tribulation comes the judgment of the sheep and goats. This is a very different judgment and it's, it's very important. So we're going to read these, by the way, these are the words of Jesus and then Matthew, beginning in Matthew chapter 25. Here's what Jesus says. When the son of man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory and the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them from one another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on the right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, you gave me no food. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them saying, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into everlasting life. And so this is the second coming when Jesus comes in his glory. He sits on his millennial throne. He comes in the glory, his glory with all of his angels, sits on his millennial throne. And this is an individual judgment of people. Now, when it says he gathers the nations before him, the Greek word there is ethnos. It just means people, just all the different peoples of the world. 
He brings them there. And the judgment here is based on how they treated the Jews during the tribulation. He said, when you did not do it to the least of these, my brethren, you didn't do it to me. When you did it to the, the when you did do it to the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. So Jesus here is talking about the Jews. Now, some people would say he's talking about believers, and that may be true. But I'm going to tell you in just a minute why I believe this is a specific scripture about the Jews and how this judgment is about how people treated the Jews during the tribulation. And by the way, during the tribulation, remember, there's 144,000 Jewish believers. When the church is taken out, 144,000 Jewish believers are preaching the gospel around the world. And I'm sure there's a tremendous amount of persecution on them, all of Israel. And, but you also have the two witnesses who minister on the Temple Mount and have a worldwide effect. And by the way, when they're killed by the Antichrist, uh, there, there is a celebration that goes on worldwide because they're hated so much. That's Revelation chapter 11. The two witnesses, two Jewish witnesses, who I believe is Enoch and Elijah, is when they're killed, the world celebrates. So there's anti-Semitism and persecution going on all over the world. All unbelieving Jews are still present in Israel and around the world. Only believing Jews, only Messianic Jews are taken in the rapture. There will be unprecedented anti-Semitism in the world in the last a half of the tribulation that will result in Armageddon. And you notice the shooting now that took place up in Buffalo is that was an anti-Semite. He hated Jews. And so Jewish, the persecution against the Jews is rising dramatically all over the world and in the United States of America. And so the entire world, by the way, Armageddon at the end of the tribulation is the whole world marches against the Jews and marches against Jerusalem. And according to Zechariah, only one third of Israel lives through that. Two thirds of Israel dies. This is Zechariah chapter 13. It says it shall come to pass in all the land, says the Lord, that two thirds in it shall be cut off and die, but one third shall be left. I will bring one third through the fire, will refine them as silver is refined and test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name and I will answer them. I will say, this is my people. And each one will say, the Lord is my God. So the tribulation will be a time of mass persecution and mass death for Israel and the Jewish people and everyone alive at the end of the tribulation will be ju judged for how they responded, hate, apathy, or help. I mean, and you're not going to be there. If you're a believer, good news, you're not going to be there. But there are going to be people there and the only people allowed to survive and enter into the millennium saved are those people that help the Jews. Now, again, some people would say that that's the church. I'm going to tell you here in just a minute why I disagree with that. And of course, it could include that. But I'm going to show you a line in that story of the sheep and the goats that I believe is the giveaway for the fact that this is the Jews. Okay, This is some of the interesting things, I believe, about the story of the sheep and the goats. And that was hell wasn't made for man. It was made for the devil and his angels. You notice when Jesus is talking about hell, and the goats that are going to go to hell, he said it was prepared for the devil and his angels. God never intended for one person to ever go to hell, not one human being. It was only when Adam and Eve joined in league with the devil that they entered into his judgment or the lost of the world entered into that judgment. There's only hell and there's only heaven. There's nothing in between. Heaven is where God is. Hell is where God isn't. And so it wasn't made for man. And that shows us right there. The other thing is the sheep nations enter into the millennial kingdom saved, but in their natural bodies. Now, I want to, I want to correct a mistake that I've made uh, in my theology. And I, I think I've said this at least once. I may have said it after that. Now, you remember that there are many people in the world during the, the millennium. And according to uh, Revelation chapter 20, that Satan is bound for a thousand years during the millennium. At the end of the millennium, he's let loose and he deceives the nations, Gog and Magog, which is just an idiom of nations in uh, rebellion to God. They come against the camp of the saints, us, the mortals on the earth at the end of the millennium try to kill us and they try to kill Jesus. Okay. And that's when Jesus kills all them, sets up the great white throne judgment, destroys the heaven and the earth, great white throne judgment, all that kind of stuff. So, what I believed and what I said uh, is that those people are the ones that survived the tribulation uh, and they're the ones that, you know, and, and, and what I said was some of them are the worst of the people through the tribulation and their judgment was 
they were allowed to live. Let me correct that. That's not true. According to the sheep and goat judgments, no unrighteous people make it past the sheep and goat judgments. But this is not a resurrection judgment, and that's very important to notice there. There are people who live, all of the people that are alive when Jesus returns at the end of the tribulation are judged in the sheep and goat judgments based on, I believe, how they treated the Jewish people. Okay, The people who took care of the Jews, the sheep, they come into the millennium in their natural bodies and they have children. How do we know that? Isaiah 65, 20. No more shall an infant from there uh, live but for a few days, nor an old man who has not fulfilled his days. For the child shall die 100 years old, but the sinner being 100 years old shall be accursed. So here's what that's saying. There are going to be infants during the tribulation, uh, during the millennium that are born and if they die at 100 years old, people will say it was just a child because the curse is going to be removed from the earth. Remember when Adam and Eve lived, I believe Adam died at about 930 years old. Methuselah died at 969 years old. People lived, uh, Noah got on the ark when he was 600 years old. People lived a long time back then because the, there was a different world back then. They believed there was a super oxygenated earth and people began to live shorter and shorter periods of time. When Jesus returns, people are going to be living an incredibly long period of time. And it says that if a man dies at 100 years old, he's thought to be accursed. And so, the, so who is Gog and Magog? They're the descendants of the sheep nations. Now, the sheep people who come in, they took care of the Jews and they come in, they're saved. Okay, they're, they're eternally saved, but they're in their natural bodies. But these are their children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren and see, the millennium proves how depraved man is. There is no devil. There's no demonic activity. People are living under the perfect rule of Jesus. And they hate it. Not the sheep people, but the people, their descendants. And so Gog and Magog, the, at the end of the thousand year period of time, these are the people who have been populated by the sheep nations. And so many of them the revolt. I'm sure some of them, especially the sheep people, they did not revolt. But many of them revolt and then try to kill Jesus. And so that's, that's, that's a different take. And so I wanted to correct that because one of the things I just, I, I couldn't imagine any saved person revolting against Jesus. That's where I got off. But the uh, judgment of the sheep and goats clearly says all the goats go to hell. The sheep people are come into the millennium in their natural bodies. And they're the ones who pop populate the world. But here's, here's another thing I want to notice from Matthew 25 there in the story of the sheep and goats. It doesn't specifically state that the sheep nations in the story or the sheep people in the story had accepted Christ. It only says that they had um, took, taken care of the Jews, okay? And it also doesn't say that the goat nations specifically had rejected Jesus. They called him Lord, by the way, okay? But they didn't help the Jews. Now listen, here. so why do I believe that, uh, that the story of the sheep and goats is about how people took care of the Jews, because Jesus called them, you cursed. Okay, this is Genesis 12. The Lord has said to Abram, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you and I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who curse you and I will curse him who curses you and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So there's not a, there's not a promise like that related to Christians that says if someone curses us that they're going to be cursed. It may be true, but it doesn't say it there. So, but what it does say is whoever curses you and the people, the, the goats in the story, it, they weren't necessarily against the Jews in the sense that, that they were persecuting them. They were just apathetic. They just wouldn't help. The Jews are going to be intensely persecuted during the tribulation, like uh, in the Holocaust and things like that. They're gonna be persecuted all over the world, killed all over the world. Two thirds of the people in Israel will be killed. Okay, so what's the point here? The point here is only the people who actively took care of the Jewish people, uh, you know, whoever that might be, all the people of the world, only those people are considered saved and enter into the millennium saved uh, and in their mortal bodies like that. So here's a question that after all this story here, now I believe this is related to the Jews, could be believers too, but I believe it's specific toward the Jews. So here's the question. Can you be anti-Semitic uh, anti and be saved? There are many anti-Semitic Christians. Okay. 
the parable of the virgins again tells us there were five wise virgins who the bridegroom knew and they went into the marriage supper of the lamb but there were five foolish virgins who did not know the bridegroom and he said i never knew you and slammed the door in their face and they couldn't go in according to jesus when he returns half the church will be false well let me just say right now there is there is replacement theology and i want to talk about this for just a minute Replacement theology is also called amillennialism. It's also called supersessionism. So uh, amillennialism is the belief that there's no millennium. In Revelation chapter uh, 20, we're told six times that there's a millennium that lasts for a thousand years, six different times. In, Re uh, in Zechariah chapter 14, in Revelation chapter 19, we're told that Jesus physically returns to the earth to rule and reign on the earth at the end of the tribulation period of time. Graphically described in Zechariah 14, graphically described in Revelation chapter 19. But there are many, many denominations and many, many churches and many, many believers who don't believe that. They're all millennial. And they're anti-Semitic and they believe in replacement theology. So supersessionism is the belief that the new covenant in Christ supersedes all the covenants that God made with Israel, okay? All the covenants that God made with Israel are gone. And this began to appear in the second and third centuries. All of the early church were uh, premillennial. That's what I am. Many of you are premillennial. I believe that Jesus will physically return to the earth uh, before the millennium, and he will rule and reign with us on the earth for a thousand years. It's clearly taught throughout scripture. And by the way, more, there are more scriptures and more prophecies on the millennium than any other subject in the Bible. Okay. The millennium is talked about at length prophetically, Old Testament and New Testament. And so amillennialist, the, the supersessionism, is they believe the church has replaced Israel, that God divorced Israel, that God has nothing to do with Israel now, and they have no prophetic destiny. And all that destiny now has come to the church. We are Israel. So what they do is they allegorize scripture. They, they take the scripture. The book of Revelation is an example. They do not believe in the literal interpretation of scripture. They do not believe in the literal interpretation of the book of Revelation. They do not believe there will be a millennium. Ah, when you say an atheist is someone who believes in God, but an atheist, an atheist doesn't believe in God. There's no God. So we're premillennial. I believe in the millennium, but amillennialists don't believe that there's going to be a millennium. They don't believe there's going to be a rapture. They don't believe that there's going to be a tribulation. They just believe that all the book of Revelation and all of that is just a story about basically how the church has been battling evil through the ages. And by the way, they believe that Satan was bound when Jesus came back. They believe that. Okay, so they, right now they believe that Satan is bound. So, so do you believe that Satan is bound? When you look around the world today, can you imagine there anything in the world that tells us that there is no devil out there doing all that they're doing? So I'm a dispensational person when it comes to theology, and that means I believe that it's literal. The Bible is literal. The book of Revelation is literal. There is some symbolism in there. There's some allegory in there, but it's clear when you have symbolism and allegory, uh, the Bible tells us, you know, in Revelation 12, that the, the dragon fell from heaven and drew a third of the stars with him to the earth. The dragon is Satan. The stars are the fallen angels. Okay, that's symbolism, but it's clearly taught throughout the scripture what that means. We know what that means. And so when someone, is some, when someone allegorizes the Bible, here's what it means. Nothing means anything, and anything can mean anything. It's just whatever you want to make it. If it's, if, it's if it's allegory, then who knows what it means? And what happens is people just lose interest in whatever happens. About a third of the Bible is prophecy. And so if you've heard me talk for very long, you know that I believe, absolutely believe, that, um, that there is going to be a physical return of Jesus uh, at the end of the tribulation, a millennial rule of Christ, a literal rapture that takes place. But let me, so premillennialism is what I believe, is I believe that Jesus will rapture the church, that we will be at the marriage supper of the Lamb for seven years while there's the wrath of the Lamb that takes place on the earth for seven years, that we will literally return to Him, Zechariah 14, Revelation 19, that we will rule the wor world for a thousand years, and at the end of that, Satan will be released from his prison, that the world will march against us and Jesus. Jesus will uh, kill them, defeat them, heavens and earth destroyed, there'll be a great white throne judgment, so on and so forth. And so this is what I believe. I believe it is literal. Now, let me go back to amillennialism for just a minute. I told you that there are five wise virgins and there were five foolish virgins. 
I'm going to just take a stab at it and say uh, probably about half of the church is either amillennial or postmillennial. And I'll explain in some other program what postmillennialism means. But both of those are anti Semitic. They are inherently anti Semitic, believing that the church has replaced Christ. See, in the early, in AD 70, the, Israel was destroyed. Okay, this is the prophecy Jesus gave in Luke chapter 21 that Jerusalem would be trodden underfoot by Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles would be fulfilled. Jesus graphically prophesied that Israel's all through the book of Revelation. Okay, especially in the chapters 6 through 19 where the church has been removed. Israel's all over it. And so God still has a plan for Israel. And here's what I want to say to all of you watching right now. If you're amillennial or postmillennial and you have an attitude toward the Jews, you really need to examine that because there is an eternal uh, consequence for how we treat the Jews. That a Jewish person has to receive Jesus as their Messiah to be saved. But they're special by covenant. God still has an everlasting covenant with the people and with the land, and he is going to be faithful to that covenant. And still to this day, whoever curses Israel is cursed, and whoever blesses them is blessed. And I believe when you stand back and watch something happen bad to the Jews and don't do anything to it, you're part of it. And so this is what the story of the sheep and the goats is all about. I love the nation and the people of Israel. I stand by them. The church has not replaced them. We're very blessed to be Christians, to know Jesus uh, as our Messiah. And one of the crazy things to me about anti-Semitism when a Christian is anti-Semitic is our Savior is the Jew. The entire Bible was written by Jews. 100% of the early church was Jewish. They let us in the club when Cornelius in his house, the Holy Spirit fell on them and they got saved. And so we, we, the whole world has been blessed through the Jews. And we need to be thankful to the Jewish people for the blessing that has come into our lives in many different ways, but especially through our Savior Jesus Christ who is Jewish. I, I, I want to say this to you again, or, or also, if you love Israel and you love the Jewish people, it says a lot about you. I heard a, a teacher one day, I think it was Amir Safadi, and he said this, you can tell everything about a person by their attitude toward the Jews. And I absolutely agree with that. When a person is anti-Semitic, it is a warning sign that there's something defective about your faith, not just your theology. But when you love the Jews, and you love Israel, it also says something very, very important about your faith. And so if you're watching right now on YouTube, we're about to go into the subscriber only portion of the program. I'm talking about the Biden administration ceding authority over the United States to the World Health Organization. Horrific decision. It affects every single one of us. I'm also talking about President Biden's trip to Israel.